All right, well, good morning, everyone. I hope everybody had a good night last night. Good first day of uh, the International Seating Symposium. Welcome to day two. We've got a great lineup today, this morning with our ISS forum. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. If you're doing your CEUs on the app, you don't need the code, but if you want to write down the code, that's probably always a good backup plan. Um, we're going to have a walkabout lunch uh, in the exhibit hall during lunchtime, obviously. And then tonight we have the ISS1 party. If you would like to attend, you're going to need a ticket. You can still purchase them at the uh, registration desk, or you can purchase them okay. at the door. So um, this morning I'd like to continue with some opening remarks. I'd like to invite Don Clay back up to the podium to give us an update on legislative um, policy issues that are going on in the United States related to complex rehab technology. So Don. Thank you, Mark. What better way to start the morning than with a legislative update, get everybody in the mood. Uh, we just wanted to take a couple of minutes to just share a couple of the highlights relative to what uh, we're looking at as we start this year. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, a very good uh, group, our CRT community, if you will, that includes consumers, clinicians, providers, manufacturers, and others, uh, have made progress around educating folks on what CRT or complex rehab technology is all about. And uh, a couple of messages I just wanted to share quickly this morning is one, uh, that we're making good progress. Again, thanks to the collective efforts of organizations and individuals, we're doing a, a good job of educating, which is the first step, educating people on the state and federal level about what complex rehab technology is, and in many cases, what it isn't, that it's not standard equipment, uh, that the uh, benefits in the provision process uh, are significant, and that needs to be incorporated when you're setting policy. So the good news is we've got uh, made good progress thanks to everybody's efforts. The follow-up message, though, is we need to do more. Um, when I talk to folks and they say, geez, we've been working at this for a number of years, and it seems like we're, we're not making a lot of progress, what do we need to do? Well, the first comment is I say we are making progress um, in terms of getting some legislation passed in Congress over the last couple of years, and also we're increasing the support for uh, the two bills that I'm going to talk about in a minute. What we do need to do is to get more folks engaged. And what I mean engaged, reaching out to their members of Congress if it's a federal issue, or reaching out to their state folks if we're talking about a state level issue. And the good news is there's a lot of tools available that people can access through a website I'll mention in a minute. But we need to reach out and broaden the uh, circle, if you will. So for example, if we're doing an email campaign to Congress, and if we're getting 5,000 emails sent to Congress, really that number should be 25,000. You know, there's a broad circle of folks that are involved in this, and so we need to build on the momentum we have right now and get more folks engaged so we can really elevate our message to a higher level. The two issues that we're focused on on a federal level uh, for this year are the CRT manual wheelchair bill, which as many of you might recall from uh, last session of Congress, that uh, Medicare is applying competitive bidding pricing to accessories used on complex manual wheelchairs. It's against uh, certain regulations and laws that were passed in previous years, but unfortunately CMS originally tried to do this for both power wheelchairs and manual wheelchairs. Thanks to the collective efforts of all the CRT stakeholders, we got the policy change for accessories on complex power wheelchairs, but that reduced pricing is still being applied to accessories on complex manual wheelchairs. So that's the focus of that legislation. Uh, that'll be uh, introduced probably in the next two weeks, and you'll be getting more information about that as we move through the year. The second bill is our CRT separate benefit category. And again, to refresh everyone on that, what we're looking to do is, within the Medicare program, create a separate and distinct category for complex rehab technology. Right now, these items are included in the DME category, so the durable medical equipment category. Uh, and we're looking to get that differentiation between the uh, CRT items and standard items uh, really codified by creating a standalone category for complex rehab technology. And the analogy we use is orthotics and prosthetics have their own category outside of DME because of the, the way that uh, the items are provided and the, uh, the, the complexity and the sophistication that you need in terms of the uh, staff and uh, provider system. 
And what we're looking to do is just like orthotics and prosthetics has their own category, we want a separate category for CRT. So again, good news, we've gotten, I think we finished last year with about 130 co-sponsors on the bill. This year we're actually condensing the bill, making it, uh, in essence, streamlining it, which we think will increase its, pa its chance of passage, and uh, you'll be hearing more about that as we move ahead. And then finally, as I mentioned, if you can help increase the CRT voice, uh, there's a website that we've created that is uh, non-denominational, uh, access to CRT.org. Uh, it's strictly about advocacy, and we encourage people to sign up for alerts. If you sign up there, you'll get alerts when something's going on that's impacting access to CRT, and, and that's the extent of it. You won't get any marketing information. It really is just all about advocacy and is a great way to get involved. Um, if you could reach out to your circle of friends, uh, whether your peers at work or your facility, uh, or customers or patients, get them engaged. As I mentioned, that website is a great starting point. We also are having our national CRT conference, which is a partnership between NCART and NARTS, coming up on May 1st and 2nd. Uh, we'd encourage you to take a look at that and join us if you can. Um, and then finally, we're going to have a session today at 4.30 that will get into more details around access and what you can be doing around that. So um, be happy to talk with you further about that. So thanks for your attention on that. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Scott Muser, the president and CEO of Quantum Rehab. Good morning. I appreciate this opportunity to remember and honor my friend and colleague, Mark E. Smith. Mark sadly passed away last November after a courageous battle with cancer at the age of 47, and our industry lost a strong force for good. Mark was Pride's general manager for public relations and consumer research, and was with Pride for 18 years. He was also a well-known member of the disability community as an author, public speaker, and advocate. Mark made a positive difference in this world through his writing, speaking, and thousands of personal interactions. He was perhaps best known for his popular and often irreverent website, wheelchairjunkie.com. He wrote five books, including a book about the CRT industry called Wheels of Change. He led a rich, rewarding life and was a loving husband and father. Mark had a stellar career at Pride. He was a very creative guy great with words, loved to talk about power chairs. Back in 2000, he actually named our rehab division Quantum. He, he named many of our products, gave input on their design, and was very involved with the invention of iLevel. He played a major role in helping Quantum get where we are today, and I will always be grateful. Mark came a long way in life. He grew up in very difficult circumstances in the 1970s with cere cerebral palsy and a poor dysfunctional household. He worked hard to overcome all that adversity and build a great life for himself. He enjoyed telling his story to young disabled people to give them hope. He inspired a number of quantum consumer advocates in a profound way. He took them under his wing and helped them turn around their lives. What I and many of his friends also admired most about Mark was his unwavering swagger. He saw his disability as almost irrelevant except for the physical limitations and that's the way he lived. And if people, in, people he interacted with weren't ready for that, he didn't give a damn. Able bodies people lack of understanding wasn't going to get in the way of him leading a full and fun life. No matter what the situation, he was gonna roll on with confidence in this way, Mark lived his wife in the life in the very way he wanted to and was a terrific role model and mentor for all the disabled people he met along the way. We should all have the guts to live, Mark, to live life Mark's way, and, and uh, all of us at Quantum are going to miss him a lot. Mark is survived by his wonderful family, wife Holly, and daughters Emily and Annabelle. Um, he was a great guy, and we loved him, and we're going to miss him but we're gonna remember them. Now I'd like to uh, in, in invite up the, uh, one of the, a man who's, who's also a force for good in this industry and one of the biggest hearts in the industry, Jerry Dickerson. Hi, good morning everybody. I'm here today to um, actually put on my glasses. At, as I learned that I'm a above average ATP at 65. 
Um, still one of the funniest lines of the whole conference, right? So, um, but I'm here today to, to speak of a, if those of you who are not from the greater New York area may not know of Paul Amsterdam, but to those of us in, in New York, he was just a one, a one of a kind individual. And I have to read from this so I keep my emotional state under control. Um, Paul Scott Amsterdam died on March the 6th, 2017. When we were all last together in Nashville, um, those of us again in the New York marketplace knew that Paul's time with us on earth was, was pretty limited. Um, and he passed away right after we all got back home. <clears throat> of the many words that I could use to describe Paul, one is exceptional. He was an exceptional husband to Melanie. He was an exceptional father to Alex and Megan. He was an exceptional son and brother. He was an exceptional ATP. And to the people that he worked for after he sold his company, especially the folks at Sunrise Medical, Paul was an exceptional employee and asset. Paul was also an exceptional gentleman. He was a very rare human being. He never had a bad word to say about anyone. He was kind and considerate to everyone that he met. Paul was also an exceptional friend. He and I were friends for over 40 years. Um, we met as competitors as we were both starting out in the industry. And um, one of the most remarkable things to, to him was, uh, between he and I, I was missing a part one day in clinic on a chair and he looked at me and he goes, that's no problem, I have it in my car. And he goes, when you get a chance, just replace it for me, will you? And that started our, our lifelong friendship. So for, four, for nearly 40 years, he represented what we do with professionalism, ethics, compassion, kindness, and grace. And every day we miss his absence. Oh, I'm sorry. And every day his absence is felt in the New York City market and everybody that dealt with him. These two pictures of Paul, for those of you that knew him, the one on the, my right, your left, is, I think that's exactly representing what Paul was, exactly how he was. He was kind of a leftover 60s hippie, very gentle soul. And the, pic, the other picture with all of us in the group was a group of us that got together originally way back when we first started our businesses to complain about therapists. Um, <laughs> and we continued getting together for uh, uh, every so often have dinner and continue to complain about therapists, our wives, our children, college expenses. Um, that was the last picture that I have at Paul. It was taken just prior to uh, about four or five months before he passed away. And that was the last time we all agreed, the last time we'll never get together again. So thank you. morning. So I woke up at about 3.34, totally worried that I was going to forget everything I wanted to say. I, I've got to remember to say everything I really want to say. And then I thought, you know what? If we can just pass on the passion for what we feel about this field, and that's what you remember, we will have done a great job, especially in light of the people that we just heard memorialized. So that's going to be the goal. We might forget to say a few things, but you'll remember our passion. Um, I'm Susan Johnson Taylor. I, am, uh, I work for New Motion as the manager of education and training, um, and I've been in this field for a long time, since about 1980. Carmen? I'm, I'm Carmen. Right. I'm Carmen DeGiovene. Um I'm a rehabilitation engineer and a clinical associate professor at uh, Ohio State University, and I've been working in this field for about 20-some years now. I'm Jean Minkel. I'm a physical therapist, and I work with a uh, care management organization in New York City supporting people with physical disabilities to live in their own homes. I am uh, Jaime Poger, and I am retired. <laughs> Third time, uh, and uh, uh, unless I uh, don't want to live much longer, I, I'll have to retire. My wife will take care of me, but I have enjoyed 
approximately, I think, 40 years in this industry. It's a wonderful industry, and uh, it's been delightful and a great pleasure. My name is Ashley Molinero, and I'm the director of the Disabilities Resource Center for UPMC Health System. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about, uh, kind of have a conversation about strategies for um, seating and mobility in the future. Um, our good friend Jerry Warren, who was just up here, often laments that he hopes that this will not be a one generation field. Me too. We have a lot of work to do. We're going to talk about the past a little bit, uh, the present a little bit, but we're really going to focus on the future. Okay. Okay, I'm going to try to say this. Everybody who knows me knows I am like not a social media person. Okay. So we have two students who are going to be monitoring this Twitter thing, and, uh, <laughs> and that's the, the hashtag. Um, uh, Carmen will be monitoring it as we go along and uh, bringing in questions as we go along. Okay, that Twitter thing. So we're going to start out with this picture that Carmen sent me, and he just wanted you to know that he actually used to have hair, <laughs> and a lot of it, and it was really curly. Okay. okay, so let's take a little bit of a look at the past, and uh, we wanted to briefly tell you how we each got started in this field. Um, everybody has their story about something that really grabbed us, that, that kept us here all these years. Um, when I started uh, working as an OT in 1980, I worked for the Crippled Children's Hospital School, that was the name of it, in Memphis, Tennessee. Unbeknownst to me, next door was the University of Tennessee Rehab Engineering Program, which was, I didn't know anything about it, but it was the pre, one of the preeminent programs in the country for the development of seating and wheel mobility strategies. So Elaine Treffler, we run by Elaine Treffler and Doug Hobson. Many of you are very familiar with Elaine and Doug. And Elaine came up to me and said, hey, do you want to do a seating clinic? And being a 23-year-old, just got out of school student, yeah, sure, what's that? <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds like a lot of fun. Well, I got into it, got to know the, the Rehab Engineering Center, and hooked. I was completely hooked and never looked back. Jeannie had actually a, a little bit of a similar start at the Massachusetts Hospital School. They had taken some words out of that. They were, I guess, a little bit more uh, progressive. Um, progressive in, uh, uh, in Massachusetts than Tennessee at the time. Um, in the same vein, uh, way back then, everything was made by hand. So Jeannie and the other physical therapists and the janitor uh -huh. <laughs> um, made foam and plywood seating systems for the residents, and she was hooked. Carmen, a little bit later, because a little bit younger, um, started out in the early 1990s. He heard a lecture at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, where he went to engineering school, from Greg Vanderheiden. Many of you know who Greg Vanderheiden is. He's a preeminent rehabilitation engineer, brilliant man uh, from the University of Wisconsin. Um, and he was hooked. And that sent him to his very first Resna conference, and it was all over from there. Okay, so there's some, there's some part of our stories that sends each of us into this field and brings us the passion for what we do, okay? So, looking at the past a little bit, I saw two patients a day at the University of Tennessee. <laughs> two, yeah, we're like two. Okay, yes, two patients a day. But you know, what, you know what that gave me? And you know what that gave those of us who started in that time? The beauty of time. We got to know the person. We actually got to know the person. We had to know the person because I was working with the technician and we were building stuff. I was talking to a colleague of mine from New Motion, Ann Kieschnick, the other day and we were kind of reminiscing and she's, I'm like, you know, we know the difference between acrylic and polycarbonate <laughs> and viscoelastic foam and epifoam. Bet these young kids don't know that stuff. Okay, but that you know, again, that gave us the the luxury of time with our clients. But it was not sustainable, and the need was huge. We didn't even realize how huge the need was until we started doing this. Okay. Um, 
and there was innovation born of need. Um, I want to point out the black and white picture, okay? A rehab engineer named Carrie Jones and a physical therapist named Brian Canyer put a power tilt on a scooter. <laughs> Innovation born, no, I'm not saying it was innovation born of safe need, but innovation born of need. We kind of took the materials we had, whether it was foam, and, and we had to make it work, because that's all we had, okay? Okay, so innovation born of need. I'm looking up because I have to go this way to be able to see over the podium to that, okay? Innovation born of need. We were part of something. We're still part of something, but it was part of something a lot smaller, and there was a lot of excitement in the air about, God, what can we do now? Um, and there's been a consistent theme throughout the conference, and some of the things that we're gonna be doing will be building on the themes that we heard um, from all of the plenary speakers, including Mark yesterday, okay? What, what happened then? What is going on now? Who is driving this bus? I think there's a feeling, and I've been talking to a lot of people about this, we kind of have the feeling that the field is driving us where we used to actually be molding the field and driving the field. So who's, what's, what is the bus, who's the driver, and where are we going, okay? And in these solutions that we're going to be talking about with, uh, with the panel, we have to remember what Jeannie Minkle brought to the table many years ago in one of her speeches, it's going to be the beauty of and, and we're gonna try to stay away from the tyranny of or, because we really do have to figure out what we need to do to move forward, okay? So emerging technology and innovation, and this kind of gets into our uh, little transition between me and Carmen. Carmen, I, I put this in the slide presentation, and Carmen thought I had gotten this off the internet, and I said, oh no. This was Nigel Shapcott's car, okay? His actual car. Um, Nigel Shapcott was a rehabilitation engineer I worked with in Memphis. He's a very, very creative rehab engineer. So he moved to Memphis. It's really hot in Memphis in the summertime, and he couldn't afford air conditioning in a car. So if you notice the thing on top, that's usually a turbine you see in the house on top of a home. He cut a hole in his roof and put it on his car. And I'll tell you, it was quite effective. The faster he went, <laughs> the more you felt like you were gonna get sucked out the roof. And the was like, just, so, anyway. Innovation born of need. Yep. You know it when you see it. So I, I like this quote, you know it when you see it, when you start talking about emerging technologies. And at first, I thought that was just something that made sense to me. Well, if somebody asked me what's emerging technology, well, you know it when you see it. Um, come to find out, I'm also a, a big fan of the literature. Um, I'm a big fan of learning from the past, learning from books, look, learning from um, talking to other people, and that's what was so exciting about this experience today, because that's essentially what we're doing. And lo and behold, I found an article that talked about um, what really is emerging technology. And the cool part is people just started using the word back in the 90s and in the 2000s. And then the late 2000s, 2010, it started to take off. And these authors, um, Rotolo, Hicks, and Martin, went back and started looking at what are the key attributes that they're finding in the literature. And the things that they're finding are these, these five key attributes, radical novelty, relatively fast growth, coherence, prominent impact, uncertainty, and ambiguity. And the reason that I bring that up is I hope this starts to frame the conversation today around innovation and, and uh, emerging technologies and what we need to think about when we leave this conference and go back to our day jobs. We should be looking for those op opportunities to create radical novelty. We should be looking for opportunities to fuse technologies to go towards relatively fast growths. We want coherence in these technologies and we want them to have, obviously, prominent impact but we're not gonna know it when it first starts off. And we have to appreciate that. Sometimes we have to tinker in order to get to the innovation. And so innovation, um, this is a, the definition that I like from Rogers in, in 2003, is an idea, practice, or object that is perceived as new by an individual or other unit of adoption. And the reason I like this definition, first off, is because it doesn't always just focus on the shiny objects that we see every day in the clinic or in our world. It focuses on practices, it focuses on ideas. 
The other thing I like to focus on is it's relative. So we're gonna talk about innovation today that's relatively important to us. And I like to use the example of when I was a grad student, we were, I was using accelerometers at the, at the time. Um, it had been used in the aerospace industry, so it was commonplace there, but for what I was do, doing, it was innovative. And then it was innovative in the iBot, and now it's innovative on those hoverboards. So this Christmas, I got to use a, a hoverboard with one of my nephews, and they would go around me, and I'd be sitting there scared that I was gonna fall off and, and break my leg. But it goes back to that whole idea, of, it's relative to what we're, what we're used to. And for me, innovation is, here's a gentleman that we've worked with, he's using head controls. For him, that's innovation. For me, innovation is how do we bring autonomous vehicles into this area and fuse it into power wheelchairs? And finally, how do we bring smart things and we fuse that together and create new innovation? So it's not about one idea, it's about how do we bring all these different ideas together? And this is innovation for me, but it'll be something different from everybody else. So we had to keep telling ourselves that this was a conversation about fr among friends, because we really want to forget that you guys are all out there. Um, this is very, the uh, first time I'm up here, it's really cool, it's a little nerve wracking. Um, but it really is, what we're hoping is that this starts a conversation that you continue to have with your friends and colleagues as you, as you leave here. And there's, there was two things that, that came out of this um, experience. One, we'll see that we had an, an opportunity to interview a number of different people before coming here. And what we learned is that this is the pathway moving forward. We are starting to see this is the path that we can take moving forward around innovation. And for somebody who's, I'm gonna just say it, who's old and been in the field for a while, some of this stuff is gonna be like, duh, we've been dealing for, with this for a while and we just gotta figure it out. And for those that are new into this field, this is the pathway so you can get a running start so that you don't have to learn bit by bit, piece by piece, but actually have a running start to get involved in this field. So we'll start the, um, oh no, we won't start the conversation. One, one last <laughs> thing, is, so I'm an engineer, I love checklists. Um, we wanted to figure out who we wanted to have involved in this conversation, and we wanted to pull consumers, clinicians, entrepreneurs, researchers, manufacturers, suppliers, people from outside the industry, people with more experience, with less experience, and people with international experience. And we feel like we did that. So we went out and interviewed Joe Boganek, Ron Boniger, Karin Lair, Perry Lowe, Scott Muser, Bill Mixon, John Priles, Eric Simino. You'll recognize some of these names and you won't recognize others. The cool part is what we were able to do is take the interviews that we did and pull together themes. What you'll see on the screens as we're um, going through the conversation, you'll see up on the screens some of the themes that came from those conversations. We don't really have time to talk about it today, but we wanted to get those themes up there. You'll also hear those themes from our panelists today, so we hope that you're able to get um, all the um, information that you need. So we're gonna start off, one of the people who wasn't able to make it with, make it um, here today, but was part of our panel was Mike Swinford. So we're gonna start off with an introduction from Mike Swinford, and then we'll go to introductions with everybody else. Sure, so, um, so I'm the CEO of New Motion. I've been uh, with the company about four and a half years. Um, Came to, uh, came to New Motion about a year and a half after uh, New Motion was formed through the merger of ATG Industry, you may remember those two companies. Um, prior to that, I was at G Healthcare, so I worked at G Healthcare for 22 years, um, always in service uh, and in the healthcare industry, uh, but to many, when I came to the CRT industry, I was still an outsider from outside the industry, even though uh, I was in healthcare and I was in the services industry, so. Sure. So that's Mike's um, in introduction. Um, the one thing I'll point out is my daughter saw this and she said, Dad, don't change your job. <laughs> don't go into the interview business. I'm like, okay, I got it. Um, so now we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about um, Ashley and Jaime. Ashley, do you wanna start? Sure. Um, how did I get started in this? <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. So, I've been around for a long time. Um, I was actually one of the first people hired at the Center for Assistive Technology um, here at UPMC in Pittsburgh in around 1995. Um, I told everyone here, um, I was gonna be here for about two years, get a graduate degree and see you later. <laughs> um, here I am 
20 plus years later um, on this stage talking to all of you, and I can hardly believe it. Um, but the people who I met working at the Center for Assistive Technology Infl influenced my life so incredibly. You've already heard some of the names, Elaine Treffler, Doug Hobson, Dave Brianza, Nigel Shapcott. These are the people who just shaped everything that I wanted to do that I didn't know I wanted to do, so. Very good, thank you very much. And Jaime. Um, mine is pretty simple. <laughs> I was an immigrant, I needed a job. <laughs> And uh, my late father-in-law, bless his heart, is the reason I'm here. Would phone every night. Did you get a job? Eventually, I figured I got to do something. So uh, there was a local wheelchair company. This was in San Diego, California, called Stainless Medical Products. Some of the older folks are going, oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> anyway, um, they needed a, uh, a sales manager. I, I didn't know anything about uh, wheelchairs. I'd only known one person in my life who knew who had a wheelchair um, from a World War II injury. And um, yeah, I'm old. And um, <laughs> I took that job and it just soaked me in. I just loved it. Rancho Los Amigos was up the road. I used to go up there to their clinics and I just soaked it up. And I, I feel totally blessed that I got involved in this industry. Thank you very much, Jaime. Jeannie and, and Susan, is there anything else you want to add? Uh, just uh, what's interesting is hearing the, the role of networks as people find their place in this industry. So my current position is I'm the Senior Vice President of Care Management and Rehab Services for Independent Care System. And a supplier friend <coughs> by the name of Jerry Dickerson introduced me to this organization 20 years ago. And we met a founding president who was using the independent living model, using Medicaid dollars to support people to live in their own homes. And he said to Jerry and I that the thing that we didn't, we underestimated was how much equipment these folks needed, how hard it is to get them the right equipment, and how to keep that equipment working. So. Jerry and I started a wheelchair clinic in a conference room, and 20 years later, we're still providing services to people in New York City. So network, network, network. And this site is a great place to start. Absolutely. I'd, I'd actually like to build upon uh, more of the, the present theme. And uh, when I said in the introduction that we had the, the gift of time to spend with people, uh, I went to a, a full day instructional course on Monday done by the three Irish ladies, um, <laughs> Sharon Sutherland, um, Rosie Gowran, and Jackie Casey. And it had nothing to do with equipment. It had everything to do with, let's step back a second, and let's stop thinking about the stuff and the how, and let's look at what we're doing and how we're doing it with individual people, which was, first of all, the, the, the luxury of having eight hours to sit there and think about something was very nice. Um, but to sit there and think about all of the stuff that uh, in many ways I think we've sort of put on the back burner because as you said, Carmen, there's a lot of shiny objects and really cool stuff. Uh, was, was a wonderful thing to sort of bring me back down to earth and start thinking about that a little more seriously again. Great, thank you very much. I wasn't sure if you're leaning forward because you had something else to add. No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> so we'll go into our, our first question. And so you'll see that on the slide um, is some of the themes that came out of this um, first question from some of the other contributors. But Jeannie, I'll start with you. What experiences did you take from those early years um, and, and apply later on in your career? So initially, it was that thrill of having an immediate impact. Uh, I too started with, with children and being able to provide a child the opportunity for mobility was just the coolest thing. And when um, Carol Schrader yesterday said, Ben ended up in timeout, yeah. I was the person going, go kid, go, you know, slam that bully. Yeah. Uh, did have to pull back the 200 pound chair, but. Um, and the biggest lesson that I learned fairly quickly, and it was interesting, it came out of uh, a request to do a book review. Oof, pretty deadly. But the topic was about the transition from expert in care to partner in care. 
And man, if you're going to be successful in working with people with long-term disabilities, embracing partnership is one of the most important things. The greatest teachers I've had are people who have lived with their disability and particularly who are fully integrated in life and, and take the Mark Smith, like, hey, get over yourselves with your chair. If my chair gets it your way, that's your problem. So partnership and really appreciating what skills and tools you're bringing to the exchange, but recognize the person you're working with has an equal amount of aspirations, goals, and past experience that you want to integrate. Great. Thank you very much. Anybody else have anything they want to add to that? Okay. That's good. For our next question, and this one goes to Jaime. You're on the spot again, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Um, what has been the most su surprising to you in this field of seating and mobility and the way it has evolved over the past five to ten years? The consolidation. Uh, on <clears throat> excuse me, both sides um, of the industry, and I guess even, uh, which I hadn't mentioned, even on the um, uh, service side, uh, hospital, the, 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 the rehab facilities, etc. The consolidation has just been lightning fast. In um, just a short amount of years, um, the number of independent dealers has dwindled significantly, and now basically two companies um, have the lion's share of the industry. I think that has been uh, pretty surprising. Absolutely. Ashley or Jeannie or Susan, anything you want to add to that? I'm that good, huh? <laughs> Is that good? Is there more that you want to add? Uh, <laughs> no, we could. Okay. I, would, I would say that uh, somebody had mentioned, and I don't remember who we interviewed that mentioned it, was the impact of the experience and skills of, of clinicians and suppliers. And I don't know why this is surprising. It's, we're constantly reteaching basic skills, so that shouldn't be surprising, right? There's always new people coming in into the field. But I've heard comments um, very often about, well, well, why are you teaching that basic level mat evaluation class? Or, you know, do, do we really need to have this again? And, uh, you know, it's kind of the surprising thing is, well, actually, yes, we do have to have this again because there's constantly people coming into the field. So I don't know why some of us got into the mindset for a while, but it's, it's a constantly evolving field of people. And I think that's a great point. And the one thing I do want to mention is, is going back to why do we ask this question? And, and this is partly, I believe, the, the engineer in me. When we start talking about where does the innovation going to come, we first have to figure out what the problems and the issues are. And that's what this question was trying to get at. Where are the problems? Where are the issues? What are the things that we need to, to think about? And, and to Jaime's point, I think you're going to hear some of the innovation is, is, is directly addressing what, what he was talking yeah. about. I wanted to just, uh, if I can add uh, a little bit to, to uh, what I said, and that is uh, even with that background of this consolidation, and a lot of the financing of the industry goes back to Wall Street, and you know everyone has this vision of these really tough people I'm trying to be nice about it. And um, but in reality, the other surprising thing is that typical ATPs are still very faithful. If they once they figure out what's needed, they faithfully try to get the right equipment. They may not get the per the preferred brands. Uh, but I do believe they faithfully try to get the right equipment. That's something we all need to try and hang in on. Otherwise, you will find that uh, a lot of the choices will be diminished, and you will not get the exact right equipment. It's a great, great point. So I think also following up on in the in the greater health care arena, where obviously many of us work because you know, the funding comes from a health insurance. So by definition, we, we are caught up in that, that change. And um, I really want to reflect on your innovation includes ambiguity. <laughs> and we are right now in this vortex of a shift from volume-based or fee-for-service care mm -hmm. to a value-based care. And in this arena, and I think this is more what's going to happen in the next three to five years, is we have to position the, the 
clinical service, the interventions, the supports for people with long-term disabilities in a value statement. How do our interventions promote the outcomes of maintaining skin integrity, maintaining functional ability, reducing hospitalizations? These are the innovations around value that we're not gonna capture in a fee-for-service model. And that's the ambiguity we're going to have to start to live in. Well, Jeannie, if I, if I just to expand, just to touch, uh, um, you, you're hitting on. I, I didn't. I'm not as articulate as you, but <laughs> the seriously, uh, this is what I'm saying here is, when if you do an evaluation and you have figured out what is the ideal solution, you may not get the preferred brands, but it is critical that you don't back down. Yes. If you start to back down you will suddenly find that you are forced backwards and further back and further back until the outcomes force people to go forward again. The bad outcomes. The bad outcomes. And you don't want to, you, you don't want to go there. You're, that, anyway, just my crappy that, opinion, but you don't want to go there. And to pick up on that, Jaime, um, I, th I think sometimes, and I've heard this uh, said many times, I think sometimes we don't value and get the word out there that we actually value what we do. Um, I think that's one of the best kept secrets that we, that we have, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, I do want to pick up a little bit on imp impact of geographic location, kind of switching the topic just a <laughs> tiny bit, um, because we're going to have to be, we have a capacity problem. We just don't have enough people to serve all of the people who need us. And in, in our capacity problem, one of the problems is geographic location. Not everybody can get to someone who actually knows what they're doing. Or, uh, or wants to be involved in, um, in knowing what, what they need. Absolutely, that's a great point. Um, so th just a, as a little side comment here, um, this is exactly what I wanted to have happen. <laughs> I wanted to talk as little as possible and have this group jump in. Just so you guys get a sense, we've had all these great conversations over the past nine months as we've been putting this together, and this is the type of information that, um, that I was hoping to get out, out of there. So the, the next question, and this is a really cool question that um, I, I'm not sure if it was Jeannie or Susan who came up with it, but the, the creative, if you had a magic wand, what would you change? And so Ashley, do you mind uh, jumping in and, and answering that question first? I do not, and actually Susan just gave me a really good lead way uh, when I was speaking about this question because um, one of the th things that I have taken on in my professional role throughout my time here in 20 plus years, um, I've sort of made it my mission in working with the RERCs that we've had here in Pittsburgh, spinal cord injury, wheeled mobility, wheel wheelchair transportation safety, telerehabilitation, information communication assistance. I've taken on the role within those RERCs to make sure that the consumers and people get to know about the fabulous work that all of you are doing. Um, I've had so much fun fun doing that. Um, I was told early on when I came in, you have a really good way of telling stories and making things relative to people. Please keep doing it. Um, when the internet first came into play, Doug Hobson said, do you want to learn how to program websites and get our research on the internet? And I said, sure. And so, you know, he gave me the support to do that. We started working on um, the, one of the first RERC websites to get that information out there. Um, they were working on one of the first training programs with Elaine. Um, again, it, it's that long distance education training, getting it on the internet, getting, you know, working with Mark Schmaler, getting that out to people. Um, this has been my privilege to tell everyone about the work that you do. I do it now within UPMC and telling people why it's really important that the, the gentleman who came in through the emergency room, why does he want he, to be able to use his eye gaze system to communicate with the nursing staff? Um, I, I've taken this on so that more people know about what you do. If I had a magic wand, I would, I would have 10 of me <laughs> in every facility. <laughs> we um, like that. Yeah. You know, UPMC, we're a large system. We have 39 hospitals. My office is committed and dedicated to the disability resources and accommodations for patients in our system. All 39 hospitals, our urgent cares, our cancer centers, um, our physician's offices. 
You know, when I, um, I'm the person who connects the dots um, with people like John Lovelace, who you heard from yesterday from our health care, from our health plan. You know, I make sure that he knows people like Mark Schmaler and the people who are working at the Center for Assistive Technology and what they're doing and what that technology means to people. Um, I, I try to make those connections within our system. Um, I, tr I try to make sure that when we acquire a hospital like Susquehanna, who I found out whenever they do ADA compliance and building their hospital rooms, they're not looking just at the physical architecture so that a wheelchair can get to a bathroom, but they're also looking at the um, assisted listening loop systems in their rooms for ADA compliance so that when they have patients who come in who are deaf or hard of hearing, that they have the, the accommodations that they need. Wow. So I can take that and I can go back to our leadership and say, look, we have this best practice at this hospital. If we can do that at all of our hospitals. That would be amazing. Um, I can say whenever we have the adult changing tables at Children's Hospital, I can say we're building three new hospitals. We should have those in our restrooms. Um, I can say whenever the health plan came to me and they said, you know, we have an award and we uh, have a lot of money, $1.2 million that we have to spend and we can't put it on capital expenditures, um, but we want to use it so that we increase accessibility in our facilities. How would you use it? And you know, that's when I say, mm -hmm. you know what? There's some new standards coming out for um, medical and diagnostic equipment um, for you know high load tables, wheelchair scales. Um, we could put a lot of that equipment in our physicians' offices that are further out in those areas where they don't know about this technology or they don't have the the funding to do it. Um, you know, the health plan said, great, come up with a proposal. Don't worry about the dollar figure, and we'll, we'll do that. So I've tried to take that on. Um, it's a little bit of a magic wand that I have, but. It's a million dollars is a nice magic wand. So. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was. We'll, we'll be happy to help you spend it. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I when I went back to them, and I I was a little nervous because that was really my first big project in this role at UPMC. Um, and it was a little over a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And you know, I put the proposal together, and I said, I hope you don't mind, but it was a little bit. And they said, you know what? We like what you're doing. Don't worry about that. Wow. So, you know, I have a lot of support from a lot of people. And the reason I have that support is because I know how to connect the dots from learning from people like you. And that's why I'm glad to be here. No, I, I think that that really gets at the heart of a lot of our discussion about how connecting the dots, talking to people, everybody, I've never found a person in this environment that isn't supportive of somebody else. And, and you'll see in the videos, I'm nervous when I'm talking to uh, Mike Swinford about that. And, and once again, it was, it was just this collaborative feel that, that we all have. The, the thing that um, I, I just want to point out from the, if I had a magic wand slide, is that interprofessional collaboration. And that's what we're getting at. And that's what's so important. And that's what this industry has always had. And we need to demonstrate, we need to tell people that we've been doing that forever as they're starting to, to look at the importance of interprofessional collaboration. I'm gonna to switch to the next slide. And Susan, what brings you joy in this field? This was actually hard to answer and I thought about this a lot. This is a very emotional question. I think anybody who has been involved in this field for a long time, I just want a water. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I just need some water. Okay. Anybody who's in, been involved in this field for a long time, uh, especially directly with client care, it, it, it's absolutely amazing to use your skills and talents to help somebody make their lives live lived in a way that they want to participate. I mean, it's amazing. Um, I spoke specifically about this to uh, two people who um, have been practitioners, one still is, one was John Pryles and the other was Ken Boganek. And the shared theme among the three of us was, oh my gosh, I, I love this field. And the more difficult the client, the more problem solving I have to do with the client and the rest of the team, the more joy I get out of it. And then I sit back and think, 
you know, at the end, at the end, at the end of the day, when you've just seen seven or eight clients, or however many people that you see in the course of a day, and you you don't usually sit there and, and reflect on. I mean, you're busy with your life. You know, I got to go pick up the kids. I got to go make dinner. Um, but when you really sit down and think about it, it's amazing the things that we're able to do because we have developed partnerships, communities, and skills and talents. And that, again, that was reflected by both John and Joe's very passionate responses about what they've been able to do as practitioners in the field. That's great. Common. Go ahead, jump Can in. I screw up this thing a little. The, um, so the magic wand. Yeah, you want to go back to the magic wand, please. About, I, just, I wanted to just say this almost as an apology to, to the younger folks out there who is about 99.9% .9 out of 100, <laughs> but uh, relative to me. But what I wanted to say is um, a building has to have a great foundation. We didn't do a good, we didn't create a good foundation here. What you said is so right. We know it. But when someone says, well, what do you do? Well, we sell wheelchairs. That's what we do. And so they treat us like we sell wheelchairs. And it pays them to keep us in that mode because they don't have to pay us well. They don't have to pay for the services if you just sell wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. That's all we do. What we do is what you explained. We make a huge difference. And, and listening to public radio here, they advertise, they talked about the show. The biggest wheelchair show in the world is now at the convention. I'm like, what? <laughs> there is so much. Then they go on to say, yeah, you'll see cushions and things like that. But you, it is so critical for us to message what we really do and the value of it. We use wheelchairs. We work in a team. We make a huge difference in people's lives. That has enormous value. Please don't forget to communicate that, because that's why we've ended up in a lot of difficult financial circumstances as an industry, because we sell wheelchairs. It's not true. So I'm going to quickly follow up, yeah, because, oh. so the good news is, yes. we got on National Public Radio. Right. Yeah. 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 There is public <laughs> acknowledgement. Yeah, well, they said we sell but, wheelchairs. Right, <laughs> and, and that's what I wanted to follow up on, that, uh, a magic wand that I would love is take a moment and think about the press around assisted ambulation. Sunday morning, the middle of July, it was a whole thing on um, uh, local walk and assisted ambulation okay, yeah. and the number of facilities that have now promoted the ability to offer people assisted ambulation and I scream at the TV set and say a it's not functional on a day-to-day -day, in and out how does somebody get back into the community and secondly it's fine as an additional mobility but we're not providing people the essential mobility to allow them to cross the street up walk sign in an efficient manner. And we have to be articulate in saying, mm -hmm. walking is the W word. <laughs> that it isn't the be all and end all. And that when you really look and promote what mm. the consumer need is, the consumer need is access to functional mobility that may have an augmentation around assisted mobility, a psychological standing up. I, I understand all of that. But for the, po the Sunday morning 20-minute session to be all about, look at these folks. <laughs> My favorite scene was it was a, a woman in her um, uh, exoskeleton shooting a basketball. Oh, Lord. But her son had to hold the brace while she was shooting because she would have fallen over. And it was like, this doesn't make any sense. So r making mobility yes. not the wheelchair as the emphasis of the work that we do. There you go. Sorry, got a little. 
Now, you know what, passion. I knew that this it's was going to happen from the beginning, so I've got contingency plans right. yes, left and right. <laughs> um, I'm just making sure that there's something else yep. to add to this one before we, we move on. Um, so this was a really interesting question. Um, the what keeps you slightly awake at night? And we're going to start off with the video um, from Mike. You know, I have a great team your microphone. Uh, that, uh, We're having trouble with your that has a lot of things that keep them up. So um, I always tell them that because I know that there's a lot of things that keep them up, I actually sleep pretty well. Um, but that's, that would be a bit of a lie because there are other things that keep me up. But I think back to the compliance front, I think, you know, we have to continue to raise the bar in the industry. Um, so, so compliance and, and someone who thinks that they're doing the right thing for an end user um, because the end user really needs something. Uh, if they're cutting corners and not doing things the right way, um, you know, that, that really can, can have negative impact. I think we all know the history around um, the scooter store and, and everything that occurred, um, you, you know, and, and regardless of the fault or the blame or, or how that ended up, it tarnished our industry. And, and there is a view uh, with a lot of regulators and a lot of government officials that kind of the wheelchair industry is, is tarnished. And, um, and that's been something that's been difficult to sort of deal with and, and try to make sure that we lead beyond that because obviously everybody in the CRT industry is passionate about serving people with severe disabilities. And, um, you know, over-prescribing is something that I know is a fear of, of uh, the governments and, and that, that was kind of the... The, um, the impetus of, of the scooter store situation, at least the accusations. Um, so that's something we always have to guard against. So I, I found that to be very interesting, just because I, I wasn't sure where he, he was going to go with that, that question. Um, and and that, that idea of compliance, and I know that I have colleagues, um, uh, we had this discussion in Ohio State around, around that aspect and the things he was talking about, and I think it, it makes a great point. And, and Jaime, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you have anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, if uh, compliance can be used to control what you do. So you've just really got to push back when the compliance um, police, whoever it is, who put compliance together are wrong. This industry has to push back because they'll comply you into a place you don't want to be. And I mean that sincerely. Um, and I've just had an experience with the FDA and, and nothing against them. They're trying to do the right thing. But they don't have all the answers. You have the answers. You just have to make sure that they understand what the answers are so whatever compliances they come up with make sense for the industry. Otherwise, they'll, com compliance, uh, out of, they'll compliance us out of this uh, industry. We'll be like dinosaurs. So, that, so just let's be clear that a lot of the people who create compliance don't know what the hell they're doing. Don't let them do the wrong thing. I, I just want to point out a couple of the, um, the, the quotes that we got from people. Just, I love the, I sleep very well, thank you. You know, I don't, <laughs> I don't things don't keep me up at night. And the, in the late night meetings with colleagues in other time zones, um, that, 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 this is an international environment we're in. And, and so those were kind of the fun ones that, that came out of this discussion. Um, the, the one other thing I want to point out, so this was a little bit of an experiment. Um, those of you that know me, I, I do like technology. I like to try things um, to see if they'll work or they won't work. Um, so I, I'm just going to let you know that I have, I have um, great people working with me. And the reason I have great people working with me is because um, the two students who are monitoring Twitter just came up to me and said, nobody's posting anything. So we made two questions for you. The, <laughs> so they're, they're covering my rear end, which I really appreciate. The fact of the matter is it just shows where we are. You know, we're, we're trying these new experiments, trying to see if things work out, trying to make it so that people can ask questions. Um, so we'll have microphones. We'll do it the old-fashioned way at the, at the end. <laughs> I just have one additional comment around what keeps me slightly, keeps me wide awake. Uh, I'm really worried about silos and mm -hmm. thiefdoms. Mm -hmm. And you know, at the, yep. this is a great right room. This is wonderful. Yep. We're a really, really tiny, tiny or uh, industry. <laughs> and we really have to embrace that genius of and. And it starts with the consumer. 
and their caregiver and their environments and really be mindful. We love all the shiny little items. I really want people to have the right devices, but what are the home care needs? Because if you can't get out of the bed to get into the shiny chair, so really being mindful and saying, and then within ourselves, okay, what, what are the compliance issues around manufacturing, but what are their impact on the clinical practices and really sharing each other's environments and situations and not going to our separate corners and to our separate organizations mm -hmm. and trying to achieve this little change when we're not gonna succeed as a tiny little industry if we're not coming out of our silos and having a mandate and an agenda that is inclusive of all of us on the team. I could not agree with you more. I think, um, I think one of the beautiful things about uh, uh, this field in the 1980s and the early 1990s was we were very unsiloed. I mean, we could call up manufacturers and say, hey, I got this client, and you know, do you think you could maybe look at making something like, and we have very much gone off into our corners. Maybe, maybe sometimes we need to do that, but more than often, if we have 15,000 voices talking separately to whoever they need to talk to, and to Jeannie's point, instead of kind of coming back together as a field, then I fear that uh, we may not be around to be making innovative um, and disruptive choices. Thank you very much. Great points by everybody. Um, so the next question, what part of our industry upsets you and why? And Ashley, I'm going to ask you to start with. Um, what part of our industry upsets you and why? So I thought a little bit about this question and I think it goes back to the fact that um, I don't know if you all know how great you are <laughs> and how what you do really impacts a person's life. I mean, I've had conversations um, with people here where someone is actually, there's actually an engineer out there in the audience somewhere, who's actually trying to figure out a way to keep my hair from getting wrapped around my casters so that I can <laughs> roll faster to the rehab engineer who said, oh my gosh, you want to take flying lessons? My dad has adapted flight controls for a Piper. Do you want them? I mean, those are huge. You know, when you look at the, the impact those two things would have on a person's life, they're at such extremes. Um, I just, you know, that's why I've, I'm so committed to talking to people about the work that you do and making sure that everyone within my healthcare system knows about what you do. And when I was talking to the health plan about the need for these high load tables and accessible wheelchair scales, I was thinking back to the Resna conference that I had attended, I don't even know how long ago, and I first heard somebody talking about the need to increase access in the medical facilities. Um, mm -hmm. And now, you know, I get to talk to people about it. Um, so I hope you keep doing what you're doing. And I hope that you, you know, I, I feel like as type A personalities that a lot of people may be in this area, you know, you're always looking for that better solution, that faster technology, that better way to do things. Um, I hope, you know, you can look back on the last couple of decades and just appreciate what you have done for people, um, just in my own life with sports equipment. Um, you know, I started this journey with everyone, walking on crutches, and when you talk about mobility, I was with Jeannie and Kendra Betts and Mark Schmaler walking on crutches through Palo Alto, and one of them said, um, did you ever think about a wheelchair? I said, no. <laughs> and I've, I've been around all of you for so long, right? And the impact that it was having, you know, walking on those crutches on my shoulders. And then I got involved in sports and technology and, you know, the people started saying, you know, you could really save a lot of stress on your shoulders and be a better athlete for a longer time if you think about the wheelchair <laughs> and, and making that transition. Um, and I did, and you know, it was the best decision I ever made. I don't know why it took me so long. Okay. Um, you know, I was probably just 
trying to make sure your research was right. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was the best decision I ever made, being around those adapted athletes and, um, you know, learning from them about the efficiency that you know, I've been missing out on for so long. Um, I just, I hope you understand that what you're doing as well, and please just stay, is good. Please just stay the course and keep doing what you're doing. So I'm going to be a little disruptive. No, please. Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I count on it. What upsets me about this industry is the third-party payment system. Yeah. And how that so influences all the rest of our decisions. Mm -hmm. And I really encourage every person, yes, that is the payment mechanism, but it shouldn't be how you work with the persons you're trying to find solutions for. That person is, they are the consumer, they are the end user, even if they're not the payer. And just approaching the solution identification process as this person is the end user, how can I include them? One of my other favorite sayings is joint participation is joint responsibility. And the number of people that come into a clinic and I'll say, so tell me how you got the device you're in. And they'll say, oh, a therapist gave it to me. Or I, I went to the store and this is the one they gave me. It was totally passive. Got to involve people. And you know, I would love, you know, my magic wand, <laughs> enable people to have access to their own funds. If the end user was the buyer, there would be a whole different set of disruptive technologies. And I always like to use the example of Dragon Dictate. How many people use voice input today? Mm -hmm. <laughs> many of us. 20 years ago, it was a $10,000 software edition mm -hmm. designed for people with a lack of upper extremity control to be able to use keyboards. It was never paid for by medical insurances, but the need grew and the need grew and the technology got better and the population of use grew and the price came tumbling down. So look, even though we can't change the third party payment system tomorrow, we can change our approach to the person is the end user and how to include them in the payment process. That's a great point, great. And, and you know, I, we, we added this question to try to get at some of these issues, but nine times out of 10, because of the, the industry that we're in, people ended up flipping them just the way um, Ashley did. And, and Ashley actually did a great job for helping me segue into the, the next question because she started talking about the rehab engineers. And, and you know me, I'm a huge rehab engineering fan, so I do appreciate the shout out to, to rehab engineering. But really getting at what emerging or disruptive technology gets you excited. And so we'll start with the video um, again from Mike Swinford. We work with, you know, I've got my team Gleason. Um, pin on and, and we're working with, with Team Gleason as, as are many manufacturers uh, and other providers and competitors of ours uh, on the iGaze technology. So I think, you know, the iGaze technology and what that does to open up, um, you know, a, a, a whole new platform for, for people living with ALS but also other, other types of disabilities, you know, leveraging this type of technology, I think it, it certainly plays with ALS. Um, having a tablet with an eye gaze drive control, but then also you can incorporate speech generating devices. There's so many other types of things you can use with that platform. Uh, so that to me is, is an exciting innovation. And I think so many other innovations are very similar to that in, in different ways. Um, and just the interface between, and, and, a, and a much more of a systems thinking. So for me, it's, it's less about the, the motors and the wheels and the actuators and, and those types of, and the battery. It's much more about thinking about the system and how does, how does an end user use their chair? How do they get from point A to point B? How do they transport their chair? How do they, uh, how do they live in their home and, and get to work and, and do their job and stay healthy at the same time by, um, by repositioning and being compliant with, with all their tilt and recline types of, um, types of um, repositioning dynamics. So I think, um, the system thinking and the broader thinking where software can start to connect a lot of the, the technologies that, that these individuals use 
I think just opens up a world that's far more accessible and far more inclusive, which is ultimately what I think everybody in this industry is passionate about. So I, I just want to comment on that. That was a theme that I heard throughout the interviews, was it's not about one piece of technology or one, one piece of technology here, one piece of technology there, but it's that system approach and how do we bring all these different innovations and different pieces of technology together to make, um, to make devices, to make processes, and, and to make overall systems so that they work better. And, and Jaime, is there anything that you you would like to add to, to this conversation? Yeah, just a, a couple, of, couple of quick things. Some, two, two, one is, I was in a mall. There were some Teslas there. They were showing them. I thought, oh, interesting. Uh, I went and asked them about the technology, and they described gearless, brushless wheelchair. And I kid you not. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, but, and, and the tying into, and it really is, two gearless brushless motors, one on each axle and a controller in the middle, and a computer screen and a car body around it. And, and it's fantastic. The difference is they can afford really good motors and stuff. And um, so hopefully between batteries That's changing technology, which is the other thing, and between um, lower cost on, on components like that, um, there will be much elegant, much better, elegant, more reliable technologies coming out. But it was interesting with the Tesla. The other thing I just want to point out, that there is a whole population that we haven't dealt with, and I think you're going to start to see r real innovation. Pediatrics, birth to 36, 48 months, such a critical time in development. And there hasn't been technology for them. It's kind of a little bit of a crime. But we, hopefully, this industry is now going to really get to it. That's so important. I'm excited about that. It gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. Is there something? So I was going after the batteries. Just yeah. then, and I appreciate Mike's, you know, it, it is yeah. a system. Yeah. Um, but boy, the, the biggest thing, if you're a power chair user, <laughs> the weakest link in the whole system are our current batteries in the automotive industry. You know, it, it's going electric, and it can only help us. Absolutely. In having higher quality products at a lower price. So keep your eye out on electric cars. Great. Are you leaning forward because you want to mention something, Susan? I am, yes. Yeah. So I was watching the Super Bowl the year before last, and a, a car co commercial came on for a Lincoln something, very fancy high-end car, but like the 27-way the seat. And of course, I'm shouting at the TV. You shout at the TV, too. I'm shouting at the TV, really? Because people can get up and leave these seats. Why can't we have stuff like that? I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen this commercial. Now I come forward. But each leg moves separately. And they move in and out. And they move up and down. Every single piece of, of that seat against someone's body had a change of position. And what, what can we do? We can tilt and recline and elevate legs. Really? So there's emerging and disruptive technology out there, again, for uh, uh, industries that can afford it, like our industries. Um, it would be nice to be able to be a little bit more emergence, uh, emerging and disruptive with the folks that we see who actually do need that kind of a seat to be able to uh, move in place, if you will. So I'm going to go off script a little bit, right. just well. because this is what, exactly what I anticipated would happen. We have more questions mm -hmm. than we have time to answer. Um, and I want to make sure we have 10 minutes at the end to um, answer some of your questions, um, if anybody has questions. So I'm going to skip. Uh, <coughs> oh, these are such good questions, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know what? Well, so the question was, who are the leaders that we should look toward? And, and the interesting thing about the way people answered it was nobody wanted to pick out that one person to say they were the leader. And I don't know if they were just trying to be nice and, and politically correct about it, but as I thought about it, if I was asked the same question, I don't necessarily think of one person either. I think I pull different attributes from different people, and you see that, um, hopefully, uh, you see that in, in the answers that, they gave, that the contributors gave to, on this topic um, about what they think of different leaders, leaders inside 
entire field, outside the field, looking at sporting goods. Um, the one that I most ascribe to is the idea of a level five leader, and that's because I've read good to great. You know, and, and so that's what, what resonates to me. Is there anything from, from the four of you that you want to add to, to the attributes and the characteristics or the people that you think of in terms of leadership? So just uh, giving credit where credit is due, the genius of and and tyranny of or comes from Jim Collins. Um, I, I, I'm a big dis, uh, disciple, but it wasn't my phrase. So uh, he, is, he is a very approachable writer that brings uh, e enormous um, academic rigor to uh, make leadership very accessible. Uh, so I, I, I saw Jimmy Collins on yeah. the slide here, and thought it was important to stretch the record. <laughs> Absolutely. So this is our, um, it's gonna be our final question. Um, what is the seating and mobility industry going to look like in five to 10 years? Um, I'm gonna hold off on the video, um, because we just don't have enough time for that, for our last video clip. Um, but um, Jaime, do you wanna start with what you think the, Industry is going to look like in the next five to ten years. What are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a fairly short time frame, um, but I, I'll, I'll just go back to this: that um, it will um, begin to, to to look like it's starved if we don't push back. I'd like to say that, and so all I'm I'm saying to everyone is: please get involved, push back communicate what we do for people's lives, for families, um, and make sure that we don't get uh, forced into a little corner and starve to death. So um, I'm hoping it'll look at least like this. I hate to be, I'm, I'm, I'm not normally a, a pessimist, but I am very concerned because of all the forces uh, working on trying to push down funding and 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 uh, that is the oxygen that that uh, uh, allows us to do what we do so i'm hoping that the the value proposition becomes our ally mm -hmm. and that it will take our own ability to switch the discussion and not keep fighting for quote a higher fee or a greater rate, but really package our interventions as interventions that are evidence-based and effective in meeting the health needs. And it's really important to articulate that the people we make the biggest impact on are people who have um, limited to non-functional ambulation, long-term disabilities, no medicine in the world is going to cure, but our interventions provide a support system that allows somebody to be healthy and functional. And not being apologetic for the cost of that intervention, but be able to identify the value when a person can get out of bed into the right support surface, into the community. They aren't going into the ER. They're not being re-hospitalized. They are worrying about their diabetes because they're living long enough to develop diabetes. Mm -hmm. So it's really understanding what the value package is and selling that to the payors selling our value. And to do that, we need the data behind it, but don't make perfect, the enemy of good, get out your success stories and tell the values proposition. Okay. You can tell she went to university and I didn't, <laughs> because that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> so it's, yeah, what she said. Yeah. Um, I'd, th I'd actually like to build just very briefly um, in summary on, on what you were saying. Um, my, my particular personal focus is very much what you were saying. Um, I think we've gone too much toward, as a field, uh, working out of teams and uh, working away from the why, which, and the why is the consumer, who we always talked about being the center of the team, but I don't, I don't see that all the time because we're in a rush, right? We don't have a lot of time. So the why, and not so much on the what, which, it, which are the shiny objects and the equipment. Um, I think if we get back to 
value proposition, why we're doing this, letting people know why we do this, letting them know the importance of why, so that the uh, um, so that there might be enough time to actually evaluate somebody um, that we have a good chance of of staying a, a healthy field. I just wanted to add, as the um, older person up here, <laughs> not these kids, what I wanted to just say is society has really changed. When I started, I hardly knew anyone who had a job who was in a wheelchair. I mean it. It has so changed, and that is so critical. And a lot of that is because of what we have done. We make people mm -hmm. able to go out and do their thing. Look at Mark Smith. Mm -hmm. He was such a character. He was fabulous. He didn't care that he moved around in a, in, in, in a, in a wheelchair. To, to use wheels instead of legs. Didn't give, he didn't give a damn. And that wasn't like that in 1979. And the, I, I, what I'm saying is society really wants us to make this happen and to keep it happening. Just a quick story. Evan Kemp was a wonderful man in the, uh, you knew him. Oh my, I love that guy. He, he was the head of EEOC. He told me, I didn't even know what it meant. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, he is next to President Bush. He's one of the guys in the wheelchair when he signed the ADA. And um, Evan told me that, and he was a very wealthy man at the time uh, from investments, and he told me he would be in a department store and someone would come up to him, this is in the uh, uh, late 70s, early 80s, they'd come up to him with pity and give him a dollar. And I said, Evan, what would you do? He said, I took it and I thanked them. I didn't want to insult them. And so, but the, the, point, the point I'm making is it's changed. And it's so important to just keep that rolling. So what if you have wheels? Doesn't matter, right? It's yeah, very it's different. Mobility. Very rolling. different. Keep rolling. So we have five minutes left. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you shot for ten, but okay. Yeah, you shot for ten. You got five minutes. It's okay. Um, the the last thing that I'm going to put up here is. Um, I, I use books as my way to figure out who people are and what people think are important. Uh -oh. If you want to, this is the list of books that everybody contributed to and said, these are the books that we think that are either important to me or we think the audience should read. I, I'm going to leave this up for a little bit. Um, there's a second slide with more books, but I, I want to open it up. Does any, I think there's microphones out there. Um, if anybody has a question for any of us. Please. Or, or a comment, something you'd like or to add. Or comments. <laughs> so we got this mic over kind of in the middle here. I think they'll, tur they'll turn it on for oh, they'll you. They'll turn it on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. Um, so I just want to make a quick comment. Um, as an American gone to Australia for the last three and a half years and learning a completely new model, Gene, I don't think you could have been more poignant to say the value proposition and a different model because the, now the model of a national disability insurance scheme, which is a new model for Australia, it has its, it has its bumps. It's very new, it has growing pains, but the premise starts at the very beginning of the document that the therapists have to fill out is patient goals and AT for their AT request. And it immediately, you must mm -hmm. identify and tie that piece of AT to that exact goal and how that goal will impact that person's ability to function in the community or in their home or whatever it is. The other piece that's important is that it also has a section they must fill out about the impact on their mental health and well-being. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about value proposition, yep. I think that that is an interesting point. And what the third point, because of time, is that there's actually a part of the model that allows the participant to have access to their funds and to approve some of their own AT interventions, you know, based on being there's a little bit of a credential almost for them to go through a process to be sure they have the ability to do that, but up to a point, that's part of the model, which I think is interesting. So the next time that we have this conversation, it might be interesting to have more of a global comparison mm -hmm. to hear what other models are doing and how we can use some of that to, to bring that into the, the model in the country in which we're having this conference. So just a couple of comments on that. 
Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over here to my right, yep. Yes, I'm a PT, ATP in Dayton, Ohio. I work in pediatrics. So if anybody out there has any advice later, our biggest issue is we're seeing insurances are all going to the Medicare model. So they're looking at five-year-old kids and saying, well, they can crawl around the home. They don't need a wheelchair. Why do they need a wheelchair in school? That's not a home-based skill. Quit, quit I have an 18-year-old with muscular dystrophy. I'm trying to get a power chair for insurance is denied it twice because he's going to be using it outside the house to go to college. And he can walk the 10 feet in his house to get from the living room to the kitchen. Disgusting. Can I just so, pause you for one second, absolutely. partly due to time? I would ask you to go and look at your Medicaid state policy, mm -hmm. very often it states mobility in the home and or community. Well, these are private insurance. It doesn't private. matter. If okay. they're a Medicaid managed care, they have to fulfill the Medicaid baseline policy. So you may need to okay. bring it back and tell them they are violating the state Medicaid policy. Is there, a, I guess my bigger question is, for those of us who may be fighting similar battles, what's the best approach to, in, or to mm -hmm. educate the anthems, the United Healthcare's, the, the private companies who don't necessarily aren't- Fight mad? every denial. Which yeah. we do. So now, is that the basic, I mean, the best way? And then, then I, I, really, I asked to speak to the medical director of the plan. Fair enough. And my favorite was uh, our own company, our private insurance, denied the power chair for an employee. And the medical director very proudly says on the phone, we follow the Medicare guidelines. I said, how exactly do you provide mobility in the home only for an employee? Yeah. Dead silence on the other end of the phone. <laughs> oh, we'll reconsider our decision. Thank you. Push. <laughs> Go to the medical director and point out the legislation of the med state Medicaid plan. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, oh, perfect. I, I, th I think that's, that's such that's an important point because we've got the issues. Now we need to take that. There's th the things that we can do tomorrow but there's the policies, the processes, the education, the technology that we can use five years down the road, 10 years down the road, and we have to be doing both. And we have to be thinking in, in both ways, and, and I think that's, that's important. Um, I think we have time for, well, we have time for one more question. Okay. Really quickly. And, and then we'll bust out of here. Hi, Carmen. Um, so, hearkening back to the uh, two slides back, or whatever, about five to 10 years from now, um, and we were talking about how the auto industry will hopefully carry over into the wheelchair industry, just like the wheelchair industry carried over into the auto industry. I would look forward to autonomous wheelchairs instead of, and hopefully that as that industry grows, we can uh, transition that into the wheelchair industry. A a absolutely, I mean, that, that technology is, is what makes me excited. And I think that goes back to, I keep hearkening back to, well, really to Jimmy Collins, but to Jeannie, because that's who I hear saying it all the time, is the end. Autonomous wheelchairs is going to be great for some people, and other people are going to be like, I care less about that. And that's true for all of us. Right. There's technology that we think is the greatest thing in the world, and there's technology that we could care le less about. And, and I think that's the, it's that personal one-on-one -on -one aspect that's really going to um, make this awesome for us. Um, I'll, I'll, before I give out the, the code, I, I just I have had a blast working with the four people yeah. up here. So just a round of applause for Susan, Jeannie, Jeannie 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 Jeannie